selected by the user, um, either through voice or through the HMI command menu. Um, and that command will actually contain the command ID within it. That notification will contain the command ID. And that's the way that you can actually correspond the request that you've made um, to what's actually come back um, from the, the sync module. Um, let me back up just one second. One of the recommendations that we make um, inside of your code, obviously we need, you need to keep track of these command IDs. So a lot of apps, they just use particular constants. That way they know exactly what command it is that's associated with the notification that's been returned. So an important thing to note um, is that there are specific commands that are reserved by the system and they can't be overridden. And we can take a look at some examples here. The help prompt, obviously it would be a bad idea to allow an app to override um, the actual help command. The help command within each app always triggers an actual prompt that comes up within the app. Um, things like exit and cancel, those are commands that your app can't actually register for, not successfully. Um, and when these commands are issued from a user, um, Sync actually executes the commands on behalf of the app. And so an example we could say the exit. If, if a user were to say app name exit, Spotify exit, Pandora exit, that type of thing, Sync would actually put that app into the none state. Sure. I mean, as best practice, you, you probably wouldn't want to utilize a command that is reserved by the system, but they actually don't apply to audio pass through. And so the help prompt is actually a good thing um, to understand a little bit more in detail. There are a couple of different ways that you can set up the help prompt. Um, option one is really the preferred way where you actually utilize the set global properties RPC and you construct the particular items that you'd like to be included within your help prompt. Um, we've actually highlighted a second option, um, which is also okay, but um, not, it's not preferred anyway. In, in the second option, the system actually creates a help prompt for you. Um, with kind of a, a handful of the first RPCs, that, the first commands that are registered within the system. Um, it's not ideal, but it is a quick way to, to at least test out the help prompt. Um, for a robust app, we really do recommend option one, utilizing the set global properties RPC. And so we've talked about throughout the presentation um, at various times the importance of adding your commands. The top level commands that you add to the system are, are basically the main functionality that your app has to offer. And so when a user were to say, if a user were to say PlayStation and then the name of my station, that could be a top level command. Um, they're available throughout the app and um, they're probably utilized the most frequently by the user. Um, another important aspect um, of, of utilizing commands is, is choice sets. Um, so we've talked about choice sets at various times throughout the presentations. Um, choice sets are good for lists. They're good if you have um, a list of items that the user needs to select from. Um, it's, it's good practice to utilize choice sets. And it, it's important though to be careful with them. Obviously we don't want to make the list too large and to make it too difficult for the user to select the item out of the list. Um, in addition to that, we have to be careful about the amount of lists that we can present to the user. And so we have a, a handful of do's and don'ts as far as uh, registering for commands and how to uh, react to commands. I think the highlight out of this slide, we need to understand that modalities have to stay consistent. And so if a user triggers an action through voice, 
um, it's good practice to continue working through voice. And so um, if a user triggers a choice set through voice, it's good practice to present voice questions after that. Um, if the user happens to trigger an action through a menu item, through an HMI touch event, um, then it's also important to continue with that modality and so that we're still presenting these, the information on the HMI screen. When we start mixing modalities, that confuses users um, when they're expecting to get back a voice response and they see an, uh, a prompt on the screen, that, that can become confusing. There are a couple exceptions. Um, you know, there are some cases where it actually makes sense, especially when you're finalizing your events. And so, say for example, we said PlayStation in the name of the station. Um, you know, obviously, a, a, a show would dis be displayed on the sync uh, HMI saying the name of the station and then it's beginning to play, that type of thing. But for the most part, especially when it it's, pertains to questioning the user, we need to keep the modalities very consistent. And so there are a number of different display layouts that are available within Sync 3. Um, we've mentioned early on and we've mentioned throughout the presentation that the register app interface response actually contains a, a lot of good information about the head unit that you're connected to. And one of the items that you can expect to receive back from that register app interface response is the display layouts. And so um, in this case, we're showing, we're displaying it a non-media app. Um, it, this one is just a sample application um, called Mobile Weather that, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. It displays the, the weather, the current conditions um, at this time with um, uh, some soft buttons and a, a menu item this actual display layout would have been returned in the registry app interface response. That's how we know that it's available for app utilization. Um, that previous screen was Sync 3. On Sync Gen 1.1, um, there's really just a couple of different layouts. It's just the media versus non-media layout. Um, in this case, um, we're taking a look at a, a media layout and it has you know, a couple lines of text that are available. Um, it has a media track and a media clock. Actually, I believe that there are two more lines that are available if you scroll down, so there's a total of four lines there. Again, all of this information comes back on your register app interface response. And so that allows you to understand what kind of display you are, you're able to utilize. And so we've talked a little bit about keeping the user in the loop about how things are going. And so when, when a, a button press occurs within the HMI, when events occur on sync within the module, it's important to keep the user posted. It's important that we don't leave the user hanging because any amount of delay that occurs there is amplified within the vehicle. It's really a different scenario than when you're looking at your handset and you're waiting for something to load. You're expecting in the vehicle immediate results. And so if there are times that we can't perform an action immediately, it's important that we update the HMI. In this case, we have uh, one of the bullet points mentions that, you know, an example of displaying a buffering message. And so say, for example, a user decides to play a station and we're trying to load that station from the cloud, um, it's important that we keep that user updated with pertinent information about what's going on right now, um, you know, just so that we provide a good user experience. Um, obviously, for driver distraction reasons, we don't want any kind of scrolling or flashing text, um, and we want to provide relevant graphics whenever um, possible. So we've talked about the register app interface response a number of times, the different types of fields that are um, included within that response. You know, here are some examples. We can say um, there are properties whether graphics are supported, uh, media clock formats, um, the number of presets that are available. Um, but it's also important to note that not every head unit is going to return all of this information. And so if we query and we don't get back a result, we can assume that that head unit doesn't actually have that information available and that feature isn't supported. And so um, the ne next step, 
This next slide is about languages. Um, Sync's available in 18 different languages. That's quite a few. We've talked a little bit about globalizing your app early on. Um, it's important that we note that the head unit that we're connected to might be configured for a different language than our application. And in any case possible, we'd like to adjust our application to match the head unit's um, native language. And so there are a couple RPCs. The change registration is a good example. When the head unit comes back and it says that its particular language is a mismatch with what we've registered, that is our opportunity from the app standpoint to re-register with the change registration um, with this new language and obviously load all the localized um, content based on that particular language. Um, I think that Teamer briefly mentioned some information around pronunciation with AppLink in sync. Um, there are some cases where, you know, the VR engine might mispronounce a word, especially if it's not technically part of, you know, the English language or, or any language. And one good example I can think of, you know, is the Glimpse application. When uh, Glimpse was first AppLink enabled, um, the sync module would actually pronounce the word Glimpse as Glimpse. Um, and, and that's a big problem because, you know, a mispronunciation of your name, um, you know, that's, that's bad user experience and it's a little embarrassing too. Um, and so using phonemes, which is kind of like a phonetic pronunciation of the word that you're trying to utilize, um, we're able to correct that. Since then, obviously, Sync has been updated. But um, if you run into those cases, we do have the ability to work around um, those types of situations. And so there are just a, a couple of do's and don'ts, um, and I think that we've probably uh, touched on them a little bit. You know, obviously one of the do's, we want to switch to the language that, that Sync is utilizing, um, and we want to listen to language notifications. And so it's also important to note that when you register, Sync can have a particular language, but the user can actually change the language on the Sync head unit on the fly. And so if they decide to switch to a different language, your app will actually get an on-language notification. And in that case, your app needs to react to that and um, adjust the strings within it um, accordingly. Um, and some of the dots, we obviously we say, you know, avoid using static strings, and, and we obviously need to be prepared to support multiple languages. So performance in the vehicle, that's, um, you know, especially an important topic, um, especially when it's centered around things like add commands, which can take a little bit of time. Um, and so what we recommend, what we encourage, is just adding kind of uh, the most important commands, you know, um, early on, and, and adding them kind of in smaller chunks so that we're not creating too much of a bottleneck on the system. And at the same time, um, you know, the user experience is, is still um, able to process things. We're still able to, um, you know, react to commands and that type of thing. Um, one of the things that we've recommended is, is doing this type of activity in a background thread. Um, and, and that makes it a little bit easier, um, both from your application standpoint and from the sync module. Sure. Correct. So there is in the register app interface response, there is the make and model. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly the route you were. Yeah. Yep, definitely. So those are, those are definite parameters within the RAI response or the register app interface response. I guess I'd encourage to take a look at the API and take a look at the breakdown of each of the items that are available. But um, for certain, you can utilize those. So. Um, alert versus perform interaction. Um, we've talked a little bit about alert earlier on, and we've talked about perform interaction throughout the presentation. Um, alerts are really more geared towards short short requests, they're short notifications that go to the user. At most, they should be yes or no type questions. 
Um, they really are the equivalent of like a push notification that occurs on your phone. Um, the perform interaction is really more in depth. It's more about utilizing some type of a list. So here's an example of an alert. There's an important information that we want to convey to the user. And so they have the ability to, to check that out. Um, it's just a quick, quick notification. It, it's not something that they have to spend too much time on. Just a glance over would, would be enough um, to understand what's going on. And so in this example, we, we kind of talk about perform interactions in a little bit more detail. Um, we could ask the, the user a series of questions utilizing perform interactions. And so in this first example, we could say select a state. And in that case, the perform interaction has occurred where it's loaded uh, a choice set of 50 states. And then when the user decides to select a state, then we could load another choice set and perform another interaction um, with possibly cities within Michigan. And as you can see, you can drive down into um, pretty detailed information. The important thing to note here, though, is that driver distraction, we limit to three perform interactions. And so we don't want an enormous series of these because, um, you know, for obvious reasons, it's going to be difficult to drive and answer all these questions at the same time. The voice recognition will take care of it, yeah. Oh, so you're, you're saying the abbreviation versus, so sync will, um, it will detect some abbreviations. Um, I think states happens to be one of them, but um, it's not across the board. I know that obviously it wouldn't be able to cover all cases, but I, I think that states is one of them though. So it's static text. It is static text. Right, correct, yeah. Yeah, so there, there can be a list, though. And so you could have multiple references for the same choice. So each choice item actually has a list of VR synonyms that you can include. And so say you wanted to say Michigan, and you wanted to say, I'm not sure what a synonym for that would be, MI, I guess. Um, you could have a list of those, and Sync will actually detect that item out of the list. So I guess another example could be temperature. If you were to say, if you had um, one choice that represented temperature, you could say temp, you could say temperature, that, that type of thing, where um, there are multiple references to the same choice. You can use multiple pieces of, of VR to the same choice. So it, that really falls on the app. The flexibility is all there, though, where you can provide a list to match that. So it really comes down to how you have your app developed, what you want to map to that particular choice. So we can probably, are you, are you going to be around for the hack or, or no? Okay, yeah, we can definitely discuss in more detail, so. Okay. Here's the, an example of a perform interaction with the voice type. And so you can see, you know, Sync is it's waiting for a response from the user. Um, you know, the user has the ability to say metric or imperial in this case. Um, if the user were to hit cancel here and the selection of perform interaction was both, they would actually be taken to something similar to this next screen where there would be a tile layout and they could actually select the item that they wanted to from that layout. And so for this next slide, um, you know, we just kind of highlight the importance of providing feedback to the user. Um, you know, when, when they've made a selection, Sync will, will repeat the selection for them. Um, you know, it's just trying to keep the experience understandable um, for the user. For the next section, uh, we talk about templates a little bit. There is, you know, with Sync Gen 3, there are a number of templates that you can choose from. 
Um, and over the next few slides, I actually have some examples of templates. Um, if, you're, if you're developing a media-based app, um, you really only have one template to choose from. However, if you're developing a non-media-based app, there are a number of templates available. So that's when things get kind of interesting. And it's, it's good to experiment and see what template really matches what it is that you're trying to do with your app inside of the vehicle. And so in this next example, we can see on the left side, that's basically the standard media template, um, which a lot of apps are using right now, you know, like Spotify, Pandora, that type of thing. Um, and on the right, this is just another example of one of our non-media apps where we're utilizing um, a large graphic with a, a menu um, that's available to it. Um, you know, again, I, I encourage you guys to experiment and see what makes sense for your app. So um, some final considerations. Um, in the development of your app, um, I, I think an important, a really important one is to try to keep things simple. Um, another important thing is to take into account consumption versus discovery. When a user is utilizing an app within the vehicle, they're generally utilizing content that's already available um, within their account on their app on their phone. And so you're really becoming a consumer there. Um, from a discovery standpoint, really working through the vehicle sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense. So it, it doesn't make sense to try to have a user create an account inside of a vehicle. It, you know, obviously because they're, they're driving, they don't have as much access to, you know, things like keyboards and that type of thing. Um, so it, it's important when you're developing your app at least to try to weigh on the consumption side versus the discovery side of, of utilizing the application. When you're um, developing your app, always try to focus on using voice instead of the display whenever possible. And so add commands wherever it makes the most amount of sense. Um, try to be careful about things like the soft buttons. Try to be careful about the choice sets that we're using and the commands that we're using as far as uh, the HMI menus. And um, always keep in mind driver distraction. Um, you know, we don't want to confuse the user while they're driving. We don't want to con confuse the driver. Their primary focus will always be the road ahead, and, and we always have to keep that in mind. And obviously there are some, um, you know, there is more information on developer.4.com, and we'll be here for the hack. You know, for those of you that are sticking around, uh, we'll provide support, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the apps that you guys develop. Any additional questions? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the... the okay. okay. Okay, right. So, sure. Sure. So there is um, a notification that comes through um, that's related to driver distraction. Um, that, will be, that will be triggered, I think, when the vehicle is going uh, over maybe four kilom kilometers per hour. And so in that case, when driver distraction is present, we know that um, you, know, you have to be especially careful. Um, so there is a notification. In addition to that, if you wanted a complete stop, we do have vehicle data. So you could query and see the speed of the vehicle at the current time. Um, so there are some, some possibilities there. But it sounds like the scenario that you're describing, though, would be a, a good candidate for driver distraction. That's actually what drives our lock screen. So that when the driver distraction is on, we know that the screen on the mobile device needs to be locked when it's off. It's an optional item, you know, you can lock it. A lot of our partners do choose to, to do so, but it's not required though. Any other questions? Um, as far as the AppLink emulator, I think Jason will probably be able to comment, but 
Um, I am pretty sure that you can, you can simulate different routes, but I think that it actually right now is set up to take a file where you have to adjust the coordinates and that type of thing. Um, but we can probably get into details during the hack if, you, if you're planning to be present, so. Yep. So there, there's a sample of the lock screen within our uh, repositories, the SDL repositories. So the Hello AppLink sample actually implements the lock screen. And it basically is, it's a very simple screen so that the user doesn't really have too much interest in looking at, at the application while they're driving. It's, it's probably the SDL logo or the Ford logo and maybe the name of the application. Um, so it's very simple. There's not really any functionality provided by it. it it's, you know, its whole goal is to lock the user out of that application during that time. Um, the, amount, the text really would be limited to probably the name of the application and just a quick connection status, but outside of that, um, we don't recommend um, you know, having too much information there, so. Any other questions? All right, well thank you guys. Gonna regale you. Wow, man, I got a lot louder. I have long, large lungs. I can just stand there and yell. Uh, so, in case you missed it, Teamer's over there. He's gonna get ready to show you the App, App Link emulator. Talk a little bit about vehicle data, um, and then we'll take a break as well. Is anybody else warm, cold? How are we doing on the room? Because I heard people. David's okay. So if David's okay. Everybody's okay. We're good. All right. I had people complaining that it was chilly, and I said we're in Las Vegas. It's going to snow in Michigan soon, so don't complain about it being chilly. And if you do, go outside and complain. I don't really want to hear it. All right. Team, are you good? Yep, yeah, should be good. Beautiful. Here's your clicker. Teamer. Thanks. <laughs> so um, just for the AV guys' information, so we're going to start with the presentation, and there will be a big demo time part of it, and then we should switch to the HDMI on stage. All right, um, talk about different emulators. We have uh, different possibilities for app developers uh, to develop against um, an emulator without needing actual hardware on there um, at their development site. And this clicker does not work. Click, click. Try again. Ah, very nice. All right. Um, so um, we're going to do a really short refresher on how to connect um, to a real TDK versus to an emulator. Um, we're going to do an overview on emulators. Um, then we're talking about how to use the Sync 3 emulator. And I'm going to give a quick demo and walk you through on how to, how to actually connect an app to this emulator and how to run it. Refresher on connections. Um, on iOS, you see the top line, which is connecting to USB. And then the bottom part is to connect to TCP IP. Um, the port is actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for our emulator. Um, and um, this would connect to a local host. So if you run your iOS app in the simulator, you can connect to the, um, to the emulator that runs in, a, in your virtual machine if you connect to a local host. And same for Android. Um, this is more also for you as a reference in the PDF that you're going to get. So you can have a look at that um, and um, connect to the right um, service. So three different emulators we have. Um, we started off with um, what is on the far left on the screen. It's the AppLink emulator. Um, it is basically a Python re-implementation of the AppLink protocol. Um, we do have um, a QTH right there that's on top of that, or just a Python. 
um, HMI, and then um, it allows you to do a virtual drive. It's a native Windows Mac implementation, so you don't need an emulator or Ubuntu, uh, sorry, a virtual machine or Ubuntu or anything. It will run natively on Windows Mac. It will give you kind of a look and feel of a Sync 1.1 system and also the feature set of a Sync 1.1 system. And again, this is a Python re-implementation of SDL, so um, there may be some discrepancies in the way it behaves and stuff like that. So this is the one, this is the emulator we have out since I think roughly like two years or something like that. And um, we moved on and um, since we open source Smart Device Link, we do have all the parts that you need to have a system up and running um, on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash smart device link, you're gonna find what we call SDL core, which is smart device link um, as you find it on the embedded system. And we have something that we call HTML5 HMI or SDL HMI that is based on HTML5 and is a full implementation of an HMI for Smart Device Link. So you can use that to connect and to start an app and to interact with an app. Um, this is relatively straightforward. It does not have any vehicle data simulation um, and it requires Ubuntu as a virtual machine to run because SDL Core currently is designed to run on Ubuntu. Um, without any changes, so you can just download it from GitHub and run on Ubuntu. You can, of course, run SDL on all different targets, but the stuff that we have online runs out of the box with Ubuntu, so that is our required um, virtual machine here. And just um, a couple of months ago, during our hackathon in Mexico, we showed off our new Sync 3 emulator, which you can find on the far uh, right side. Um, and this is basically the tool that we would propose everybody uses for the hackathon to develop. So it has the same SDL core as the emulator that we show in the middle. So it actually runs the same code base that is running on the sync head unit. So you won't find too many differences in the behavior. They should be absolutely um, similar. It has a QT HMI that is very similar to what we have in the car. So, I mean, if you look at it, it, it looks um, very much alike. Um, it does not have all the features of a full in-car infotainment system, so there's no navigation system in there, and you can't make a phone call and stuff like that. But other than that, it has the look and feel of a real in-car system. So, um, actually, I didn't update this slide. I'm very sorry. So it says not yet publicly available. This is not true anymore. This was true for the Mexico Hackathon where it wasn't uh, released yet. Um, we have released this um, emulator now on developer.fort.com. Um, so you can go there and download it um, and set it up in an Ubuntu virtual machine. It does support vehicle data simulation, so you can support all the different vehicle data items that you're interested in. And um, as Marcus mentioned, Jason worked all weekend to get the um, virtual drive in there. And it is not yet finished, so uh, I hope I'm gonna get an updated binary in a couple of hours. Um, and we're gonna have the capabilities for you guys to simulate a drive. So we do have a couple of pre-recorded drives around Michigan that you can feed in, and then your GPS positions will update as you move along. So if you're interested in doing something based on POI or like location-based information based on a drive, um, we have a couple of pre-recorded drives that you can use and you could, can put your point of interest around these drives. Um, the good news for all of you guys is you don't have to download it and set it up and download all the dependencies. We know how flaky Wi-Fi is most of the times in big conferences. So um, we're gonna hand out to all hackathon participants, we're gonna hand out a USB thumb drive later that has a virtual box, virtual machine, included that has everything set up and ready to go. So you don't have to download anything, it's all there. You just go start it and I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second. This thumb drive will also feature all the presentations we we're talking about. It will feature all the code base from GitHub. So I downloaded all the repositories so that you don't have to do that. It's all on there as zips so you can just get started with the Hello World examples or RPC Builder, the tool that we use for testing these RPCs that I'm gonna show you in a second. Too. So yeah, so this is, these are the two different ways to do it. Um, either the left, you download VirtualBox, you download Ubuntu, create a virtual machine, and do all the setup, or on the right side, you just use the VirtualBox disk image we provide, start it, run, and you're done. Okay, so now this is going to be the experimental part. We're gonna try to switch to this machine. Let's see how this goes. 
gives me time to drink. Oh, perfect. Great. So then you start the virtual machine that we're going to give you guys on the thumb drive. You're going to look at this. Um, this is the virtual machine. And um, if you want to start the emulator, it's not really hard. So what you could do is, um, first of all, there's a readme. That's, there is a lot of content in there. It basically tells you to open this folder and then run this and double click it and just say run in terminal. And if you do that, uh, what will happen is you will get a sync HMI basically. So you see it looks a lot like um, a real infotainment system in a car. You have your the different domain buttons down there, um, nav, phone, climate, apps, and stuff like that. And so um, you can see there are no apps connected at this point in time. You can go back and see a couple of fake screens that don't do a lot. Um, but we don't have any apps connected. So this is the main UI of the emulator. So this is where your app will come up and where you can use your app. The emulator does have a couple of different features because obviously your Ubuntu doesn't have voice recognition. It doesn't have text-to-speech. So it has a hard time to use voice recognition commands. So um, we do have a couple of different fields here. So we do have this one, which is basically an overview of um, commands um, that you add um, to your system. So for example, if you do an interaction choice set, um, you will find all these choices in there, and then you can, again, select them and stuff like that. So all the voice interactions and text interactions in the emulator are recreated in a text-based interface. But if you then disconnect your app from the emulator and connect it to a real car or a TDK, there will be no difference in the interaction. So then everything will work just as well, just with the real voice recognition system. So this is really just a different kind of um, interface to your voice commands. And then the other thing I told you guys, you'll be able to simulate all the vehicle data items. So what you can do um, here on this screen is basically um, set all the different vehicle data items as you wish. Um, so you can go in and go into these different categories and then set, for example, um, the wipers and headlamps and set them to, to all the different values that are possible, um, user inputs, um, engine torque, and pedal position, stuff like that. And you can set that, and your app will get the updates. So you can set that. Um, the virtual drive does manipulate a couple of these items. So for example, also RPM and different other um, vehicle data items. So when you do your fake drive, there will not only be GPS positions that update, but also other vehicle data items. So you can also gather data around RPM and other stuff. I'm going to go back to the HMI and make this window a little bit smaller. So what you see here um, on the right side is um, what we call RPC um, Builder app. So this is, you can find this on GitHub. It's one of our iOS sample applications, and it basically allows you to connect to a Sync 3 AppLink um, head unit or to the AppLink emulator and um, send every RPC that you wish to send. So the first screen that you see is asking you how to connect and um, you can see you can either select TCP IP or Bluetooth, uh, sorry, or USB via iApp. And you select TCP IP, you put IP address in, local host, and you put in the port 12345, and then you select next. And then you have all these settings that go into register app interface. So you have the name, you have the um, TTS name, VR synonyms, media applications, and all these different things. So um, you set everything up as you wish, and then you just hit send. It does send the register app interface, um, and you can see how the spec app pops up in the emulator. So now you have the spec app in the emulator, and um, what you can do is you can basically start it in the emulator, and you get into the app. Now, because this test app does only do what I tell it to do, we don't have any text on the screen. Your app should obviously right away populate some text and give the, inf give the user information. So for RPC Builder, what we do is, these are all the RPCs that you can actually send to the head unit. So I go to show, and I showed you a show before. I showed you a show before. Sentence. I showed you a show before, and so you can put different main fields in here. So we say,
And you see when I sent this, it will populate it in the emulator. So this is what your app will basically do, is you, you, put, you put your arguments into your request, you send a request out, and it populates on the emulator. And you can go back and forth between different um, tabs here and go back into your app. Now, we were talking about commands. So we were talking about your features in your app should be um, basically put in as command into the system so the user can interact with these features. So of course, the add command button is also here. So you go into add command, you, say, you give it a command ID, um, you give it a, put a menu name, which is uh, choose playlist, um, we give it a position, and we save this, put in a VR command, go like this, send it out, and um, if you go to the menu, we have our choose playlist item there. So you see, um, when with this app, you can use the different RPCs and try them out and uh, play around a little bit with the emulator. And um, what you can also do in, the, in this tool is we do have a console part to it where you can see what RPCs get sent back and forth between the app and the head unit or the emulator. So as you see, you've seen me sending the add command request, right? So I can go into this request here, and this is probably too small to read, but you can see the JSON data that gets actually exchanged between the app and the head unit. So you can see what you sent before. Um, and then, of course, for you, it's interesting what did the head unit tell me about my request, so you can also see the response, which is a success. So all these responses come into your app as callbacks, so you can react on them in the, as a callback. So the RPC Builder app, the question is, is this in the App Store? The RPC Builder app is not in the App Store, but the source code is on GitHub. So what you do is you download it from GitHub, press compile, um, and then you run it. So there is no secret. Um, in this app, um, it's all open source. It's an open source tool to try out um, AppLink. So now, I told you how to react um, on playlists, um, or sorry, on the commands that are chosen. Now, if I go in the emulator and um, select this command, you can see here I get an on command notification, and this is the notification that you get, and that will trigger you to do something with that command. Now, it's your turn and start interacting with the customer. For example, create an interaction choice set or doing something like that. So you can also see, well, let me go in here. So um, in, this, in this layout, and I told you this is the VR, VR um, simulation. So you see here, after I added my choose playlist command, um, you see it added to this um, list here. And so you have choose playlist in there with the ID 13. So now I can basically press the voice button and then choose playlists. And you can see here, I also get um, the on command notification after I chose a VR command. So this will simulate the user pressing a push to talk button and then saying a VR command. So basically, um, you can simulate the customer or the driver using a VR command. And also what you see here is the difference on how we tell your app if it was triggered by VR or by menu. So in the case of the VR, you're going to see a trigger source VR. So you know the user chose this command via voice recognition. So talking about best practices that Marcos laid out, if the user chooses a command via voice recognition, you would like to respond with a voice recognition command somehow. So you want to keep, it, keep the voice interaction going. Now before that, I selected a command via menu. So when you look at this, the trigger source is menu. So now you know the um, user chose this item from the menu, so you want to have a menu interaction following that. So you keep it as the user wishes. And then you look at different parts. So now we're going to go um, through um, get vehicle data. I'm going to give you a quick overview on get vehicle data. Um, so get vehicle data is basically organized as a big RPC that has a lot of different arguments. Each of these arguments is one vehicle data item. And if you set this vehicle data item to true, you want to request the, you want to request the content. So for example, I'm interested in the current speed. Let me check in here. So we put the speed up a little bit. There, yeah, that's German speed, 170 kph. We put this in here. I press send. We go into 
the, um, into the console, and then you can see I get a get vehicles uh, data response, and it includes the speed I just set in the emulator. So if I set it to a different speed, obviously this um, speed argument will change in the response. So you have, your, you, have, you have your data items that you can get on a one-time basis. Now when we look at subscribing vehicle data, and I'm gonna go into subscribe vehicle data right here, and I'm gonna subscribe speed. So the only thing I'm gonna get back, um, and that was what I was re uh, referring to earlier, the only thing that I'm gonna get back is the data type and the result code. I will not actually get back the value of the speed in this case, but now when you look at the console, when I change the speed value, I'm gonna get vehicle data notifications, so 282, oops, and then the next one was 238. So whenever speed changes, you will get a notification on that, and it's rate limited, so you will not be spammed by speed notifications generally, but you will be up to date on what happens um, with the car in terms of speed or any other RPC that you request. Especially interesting when you do the um, simulator drive because then you get constant updates on the different, um, different arguments and different vehicle data items. So um, this open source tool can actually do um, two more things. Um, we have the uh, modules here. So what you can do is do audio capturing. So you can use a voice pass through and capture that audio into a file and then play the file. Obviously this is not very helpful for your app, but it's quite helpful to test the system and try out the system. So you can do that, but for your app you have to take the binary data and do something with that. So um, this is very, um, very helpful for testing audio pass-through. And then it can also do some audio and video streaming. So anybody interested in mobile navigation, this tool can also help you to have a look at that and see how this works. So, the, so and then um, maybe, oops, um, maybe we go in here and you see there are a couple of RPCs in here that we didn't discuss. So we do have quite a lot of RPCs. Um, some are related, for example, for submenus. So if you, wanna, um, if you wanna actually categorize your menus and have your commands and have one command that is based on location and the other one, I don't know, is a different category, you can create submenus. So you basically have one main menu and then go one level deeper. So we have the add submenu RPC, we have alerts, and we have a couple of other things. So I would encourage you guys to just have a look at RPC Builder if you're interested in the general capabilities, or of course, our documentation that has all the different RPCs that you can use in there. So maybe we do an interaction choice set. This is kind of an interesting one too. So interaction choice set you can find here, and when you do an interaction choice set, um, again, just to, as a reminder, this is the basis of doing a list for a customer to choose an item from. So when I want to do this, I'm going to give this an ID that I can remember. I'm going to create a choice set and create a choice ID. Menu name is choice one, VR command. Go back, no image, no secondary text, we all. I have one choice, maybe add another choice to this. Go in here, another choice. So you can see how I um, gray out these different items. Um, in this tool, so in, in SDL appling generally, there is a difference between not sending an item and sending an item empty. Um, and so if I gray out, in this tool, if I gray out the different fields, I don't send this item at all. Um, if they are actually darker, I send it empty, which can be an issue in some instances. If you send something, you have to put some data in. You can't send it empty. So I'm gonna gray them out, and then I don't send these parts at all. So this should give me a success back. So this worked. So you also see in the voice part, we got choice one and choice two here now. And you will notice nothing really changed in the app. So these lists are invisible to the user at first. Like there's no indication that you actually created an interaction choice set. This will just be purely stored on the head unit. But now if I go into perform interaction and let me see. There it is. 
perform interaction. I do manual only, and then I'm gonna select the list of interaction choice set IDs that I created before. So this should be enough. Yeah, something is missing. Look at that. So this is one of the examples where you see, so I got, I got a response success zero um, result code invalid data, which tells me that I'm missing something that the system expects. So I'm missing some item that the system wants to have in order to actually process this. I am absolutely, I'm actually not 100% sure which one it is. Could be a timeout. I do a list only one. Okay, let's try this out. Still invalid data. So let me see. Actually, I'll be fine. So what I maybe did is select the wrong performer. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> you can imagine if I send a performance action, I will be able to get up the um, performance action prompt here. Interesting, that should work. Anyhow, um, so when you send a performance action, you will be able to bring up the prompt, and it will. You can then choose one item, and you get a response with the item in there. Um, I will stop fiddling around and try to find out um, what the issue is in here. Um, but you also see how you can track your issues and. Everything that's in the console is also accessible for your app. So if you look at all the callbacks you're getting and all the requests you're sending out, it, that is basically what we show in the console. So you can go and um, look into your um, on, uh, <coughs> sorry into your responses and get um, can get result codes if it was successful or not, and then figure out what went wrong. Yes. So if you wanna, you can set up uh, multiple choice sets and reuse them through the application. Um, if you wanna change a choice inside a choice set, you have to delete the choice set and recreate it with different choices. But you can, uh, so the question was, can you reuse um, choice sets basically? So yeah, you can reuse choice sets across your application just if you wanna change a choice in a choice set, you gotta delete it and recreate it and then um, you can use it again. Any other questions for the emulator? How it works? How to connect? Is it good? Very good. All right. Um, so this is the emulator. Um, you're going to get this. As I said, you're going to get this um, uh, virtual box image. You can use that, and it um, should be as simple as hitting the start.sh um, script, and everything goes off. And then you can try it out with your own app in the simulator, or you can use RPC Builder, or you can use our Hello World applications that we have for for um, Objective-C, for iOS, or for our Android, um, Android Studio, or Eclipse applications. All right, so um, we can switch back to the presentation. <clears throat> so currently, we don't have RPC Builder for Android. Um, to be totally honest, we didn't have a resource available to build it. So um, if you want to do it, you're more than welcome to do it. Uh, you can push it to GitHub. Um, we're looking into getting it done with an Android developer at one point, but we currently don't have it, unfortunately. So, But we do have Hello World um, applications that you can try out, and then it's very similar. So I think that is... This is key info um, in this presentation. As I said before, you're gonna get all these presentations, so you can use this as reference. Um, especially important um, on the last hackathon, um, a lot of people ask me, the username and the password for the virtual machine are on the right side. So they are in the presentations, so you can have a look at them and use them to log in and to do whatever you need to do. Also, we do have newer versions of VirtualBox by now, so I should have updated this slide too. Um, you, want to, you will get 5.1.4, I think. Right, that's uh, for this presentation. I think we're gonna do like a 10 minute break.
um, and we'll be back like by um, 2.40, and um, I think Scott will talk after that a little bit. Thank you.